And this is not a rant. This is a little bit thought, more thoughtful and a little bit slower. Um, and it's just a laying out of certain thoughts about that most contentious of our issues in this country, abortion. And the probability, as we face it, that the landmark Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade, will either be completely overturned or profoundly curtailed within the next few days. And I just want to mention two things, and this is, this is sort of, because for me, this issue is really beyond what we commonly think of as right and left, if you will. Uh, because most people don't really even think about where that language comes from, you know, right and left. Uh, of course, that language comes out of the French Revolution. And, um, you know, people in the General Assembly who were trying to reconstruct the government, um, you know, after the the various, thir the third estates, the, the, you know, the three estates sort of dissolved. The people that tended towards one side of the political order would sit on the right side of the assembly hall and people who sat, who had the other idea or other ideas would sit on the left side of the assembly hall. This is, and, and many people sat in the middle. So this is where we get this language. And we think we know what it means. But again, it's far more complicated. First of all, there's that rights language, the rights language that people like to argue about, about, you know, whether a human fetus has rights or whether it has potential rights or um, whether it's a human being or not, or, um, you know, whether it's a human being that should be privileged above the, the ability to choose of the mother, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to look deeply into this, you can, because, in fact, the language that Justice Alito was using um, demonstrates, even though it demonstrates it in a really egregious manner, it demonstrates exactly what tradition uh, certain, certain members of the anti-choice movement use, especially those who are more religiously oriented use, um, to try to argue that there isn't a constitutional protection um, for a woman to choose what to do with a pregnancy. Um, and some of that language can actually be found in things like John Locke. And John Locke is, of course, considered to be one of the philosophers who informed um, the idea of individual rights that you find enshrined in our Constitution. And so it's useful to kind of think about John Locke and what he meant by um, rights, individual rights. And part of what he meant by rights was that an individual had the right to their own person, that in a sense your body is your property. Uh, and it's, it's based on that notion of, of your individual body being your responsibility and your property that he then creates his idea of what property means and what free enterprise means, and even what money means. All of that is sort of connected to the idea of your body. Uh, because if you own private property then it, or use money, those things become extensions, if you will, of your body, um, of your sort of private territory. Uh, and in the same way that you can uh, choose what to do with your body and should actually responsibly choose what to do with your body, so you should also uh, you have the right to do to do that with your personal property or your uh, money or whatever. And it's fact, in fact, it's based on those ideas that certain notions that are contained within the 14th Amendment emerge. Uh, the right to privacy, the right to, to not have an external power like the state take away those rights, that kind of thing. And, it's, and, and it is, in fact, on the 14th Amendment, uh, based on the 14th Amendment and those ideas that come ultimately from Locke, 
that corporate lawyers then later on in the 19th century argued that that corporations are like a body. They're like a, a private individual, private person, and have many of the same rights. So you can see where this kind of goes. But the other thing that John Locke says is that um, he talks about women and 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 the marriage contract and how the marriage contract is a different kind of contract and 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 in the marriage contract women basically give up their ability to be private citizens they give up their bodies they give up uh, they don't if you're married as a woman as far as John Locke was concerned you 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 no longer have your own body your body belongs to your husband you have given up that 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 right to privacy, that right to choice. And so um, when rights language is being used to describe whether or not a woman has a choice or whether um, the fetus ha the fetus's potential life has a greater uh, is a greater good than a woman's adult choice, um, this language is is wrapped around, uh, all of these conceptions in Locke, you know, and, and I used to point this out when we would look at Locke in Western civilization classes. And the question that I would always ask my students is, is that this notion of rights and kind of the individual uh, autonomous body, you know, like our bodies are separate bodies that we have rights to and, um, you know, and, w and within a state and and within the social contract that John Locke describes, we 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 uh, we exchange those absolute rights for a kind of governed liberty, uh, so that we can all have a space to share at least some of and exercise some of those rights. But we also have responsibilities to each other, which is part of what Locke talks about. Um, although women aren't really part of this because he really envisions this as being in a marketplace essentially and women are not to be in the marketplace as far as he's concerned uh, but I would I would ask my students I would say you know um, and on the other hand for for, for John Locke uh, a fetus probably would not be human uh, because for John Locke a human being is defined as a being that has the has self-awareness and the ability to make rational choices which it's doubtful that a fetus would be able to do that. So the notion of whether a fetus would be a human being or not, to, to have the kind of rights over a woman or any other adult human, it's not clear, all right. But anyway, these, the, the, these are, this is the place where Locke stands, all right. And, and the anti-choice people, the quote unquote pro-life people, they like to, to, to talk about the rights of the fetus as if the fetus was a reasoning human being, um, which it's not, um, although it is clearly genetically human, obviously, couldn't be anything else. Um, and, and the pro-choice people, of course, talk about adult, adult women as being human beings, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and what I would always ask my students in Western Civ is to think about whether or not this, right, this rights language is really sufficient language to be able to talk about and to really discuss the complexities of what it means to be pregnant, of, 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 what, of the whole issue of reproduction and power, um, Particularly when John Locke just wrote women out of this equation entirely. You know, he didn't even consider, you know, once they were married in particular, them for, for, he didn't consider them to be free agents in any way, that they would have any right or responsibility to make a choice about their own lives uh, or, or the lives of their families. So, and, and, of course, that's very English at the time. You know, I mean, at the time when he was writing, um, if you took your your husband's name, you did not own private property. Um, um, he, he that your husband could abuse you or rape you at will. You know, it you basically did not exist as a human being except in service to your husband and and maybe your family, your husband's family. So um, and your children, obviously, if you had them. Um, so it was a kind of enslavement uh, in, in many ways. I mean, we would consider it a kind of enslavement. Many women would today.
I, I, don't, I doubt that many American women, women would actually put up with it. But in any case, the question that, that I asked my students is, is, is this rights language really sufficient to, to capture the complexity of all the politics that are involved, um, especially, you know, the health issues, um, you, you know, what about instances of incest and rape? What about instances of health for the mother? You know, um, there, there are lots of other things that come into play with this. And, and then I would always give them examples from other traditions, you know, like the Jewish tradition or the Islamic tradition, where if the mother's life is in danger or there are, are deep economic um, difficulties that are going to attend the birth of another child, in many cases, both Jew Jewish and Islamic law mandate um, that uh, abortions can occur. And in fact, if the health, if there are already children in particular and the health of the mother is at risk, that it's almost required um, because living children are considered to be um, more of, of higher priority. You know, children that are actually born are considered to be of higher priority than a possible child. Um, and certainly in both Islamic and Jewish law, if the mother's law, life is in danger, so, um, in, in the case of, of, of preeclampsia, for example, or um, ectopic pregnancy or a variety of other things, that the, that, that the pregnancy must be ended. Um, so, it, you know, I just gave them other examples of this, you know, and for them to think about. And the other thing that I would always ask them to think about, which is, and I've talked about this with my students even very recently, is that, is it really the issue of abortion, or is it the issue of trying to figure out how to deal with unwanted pregnancies, how to prevent unwanted pregnancies? Because there's a simple way to prevent unwanted pregnancies um, or unexpected pregnancies, and it's called birth control, contraception, which granted some women can't do, uh, but most women can in some way or another. And the fact is, is that our medical systems, our insurance systems, and our cultural and religious and political systems make it very, very difficult for women, uh, all kinds of women, to get contraception. Um, what, either it's not available or it's, uh, or it's too expensive um, or a certain, you know, certain religious beliefs will prevent one kind or another. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like, that's the simplest way. You know, the, the, the only choice that a lot of, that a lot, not all, certainly, but that a lot of anti-choice um, people give is abstinence. And we all know that that's just crazy. You know, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to work in most cases. Um, and trying to mandate that has not worked. Um, every, every, every place in the world, and this has been done in Africa and Asia, there are lots of studies about it. I mean, in, in the description, I'll provide some studies about it. But in every, in every case where um, contraception and family planning has been freely and openly available to women, to women and men, but to, to women, um, abortions have declined markedly, rapidly. And so to me, it just makes practical sense that if uh, you want to reduce the number of, of, of unwanted and unexpected abortions, you just simply reduce the number of unexpected and unwanted pregnancies. And you do that through contraception and education. And it doesn't have to be public school education if you don't want it to be, if that freaks you out, even though the very same people who freak out about it are probably the people that are least likely to actually talk to their kids about it. It can just be available in public. You know, it can just be there. It can just be available. And, um, it, and all it does really is require that people become acquainted with their own bodies. I, it, the, the, the amount of ignorance that people have about their own bodies is just stunning to me. It's, it's embarrassing. There's just no reason for people to be this ignorant about their own bodies and how, the, and, and how reproductive processes work. But every study that's ever been done has shown that you reduce abortions um, by reducing the number of unwanted and unexpected pregnancies. It's the easiest way to do it. It's the most effective way to do it. It's the most practical way to do it. 
And the fact that the vast majority, not all again, but the vast majority of people who are anti-choice are also anti-contraception, that indicates to me very clearly that it's not about abortion. It's about controlling women. It's about controlling um, the, the, the information that women have. It's about controlling the choices that women have. It's about not permitting women to be responsible, full um, human beings in choosing um, not simply what to do with their bodies, but, but choosing what to do with their lives. Um, because it's not just about your body. It's about, it's about and, and whether or not you're going to be forced to give birth or not. It's about what you're going to do with the rest of your life, whether you have this abortion or not, or have this kid or not. You know, it's, it's not just about the kid. Um, kids are not born into vacuums if they're born. You know, they're not born into vacuums. And so if, you know, a, a, a woman, if she's going to make a choice to have the kid, she's also going to need support in doing that. And our society does not support women very well who, who even make that choice or who are forced to make that choice because um, resources are limited. Um, so it's very clear that, you know, in most cases, the, the anti-abortion people or the anti-choice people are not talking about abortions at all. They're not interested in actually stopping the mechanics that create unwanted pregnancies, which would automatically produce fewer abortions. They're just interested in controlling women. And they're just interested in, in trying to promote a certain religious or political view that may or may that that well statistics have shown is not the majority view in the United States. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, every poll that's ever been done has shown that the majority of Americans believe that abortion should be safe and legal in in most or all cases. And I mean, we're talking upwards of two thirds. We're not talking marginal things here. We're talking large majorities of the American people. Um, so. That indicates that the bulk of American people kind of get this. They're sort of practical about this. While they may personally not be ent entirely comfortable with abortion if they had to face it, if they're a woman and they had to face it, um, they don't necessarily believe that the, they don't believe that the government should be in the position of making that choice for them and preventing it. So, um, because that's what choice is. If you have choice, then you can choose to do it or not. If you don't have choice, you see, then you don't have choice. You're forced to go along with a certain perspective that may or may not reflect your own reality. Uh, and that's just, you know, the notion that that could be considered anything remotely American is bizarre to me. Um, and I'm coming at this from uh, an old style Republican standpoint uh, in in the in the 1950s 60s 70s and even into the 1980s there were many 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 republicans who were very pro-choice because it's considered to be um, an act of self-responsibility uh, so that the government does not interfere with a, a private matter uh, between a, a, a woman and her family a woman and her husband and, and her doctor that there's no, there's no government interference there, essentially. Um, it, and so ultimately, that privacy argument is a conservative argument. It is not a liberal argument. It, that may not be something that a lot of religious people want to hear, but, you know, there's, a lot, been a, there's been a lot of brainwashing in the last 40 years, you know, d deliberately confusing what is a conservative and a liberal argument. Um, my family has tended to be very pro-choice because we, under even though I was raised Republican, a moderate Republican, we always understood the separation of church and state. We always understood that um, that we wanted minimal government interference in our lives, and that included um, minimal government inter in interference in personal decisions that would impact uh, personal lives and the lives of our families. And so that's why something like Roe v. Wade, which was largely argued on privacy grounds, um, 14th Amendment privacy grounds, um, is considered to be important. Now, whether that language is sufficient 
uh, to really underscore uh, the complexities of the reproductive processes in women, particularly since all of John Locke's definitions are very, very male oriented, is another issue, you know, and, but, and it's something that, that, you know, in our, in the classroom, it, it could not be resolved uh, because we only have one, we only have some language to describe this. You know, we don't have the language of the Haudenosaunee or, you know, other uh, other groups of people from other cultures who 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 may have deeper understandings of what you know these these connections are. Uh, but um, in any case, this is my take, and um, you can probably understand where I fall politically on this. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean I don't think that it isn't very complicated. <laughs>